Walking a path along the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and whether our resolution this year should be to be more or less raucous in the coming year. At a corner table by the fire are three people. One of them is so proud of his resolutions this year. And yes, they are in the form of an outline. Uh, that's me, Matthew Melema, and welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Here at Believe to See, we explore the relationship between faith, art, and storytelling. Our goal is to help you connect the great story, the great stories, and our own stories in order to understand what it means to live with a Christian imagination. Now, we are recording this episode in early January, that special time of year when a stressed out person's fancy turns to thoughts of resolutions. I think I speak for everybody here when I say that in those sugar-fueled days on the couch between Christmas and New Year's, I started working on some of my own resolutions. And as I mentioned earlier, they did involve an outline. But why do we do all this? Uh, at least part of the answer has to be with our individual views of our own life stories. As our own protagonists, we feel that some stake in the ground is necessary for us to advance the plot. But why is this? Uh, and let's expand that issue a little bit more broadly. Even outside of the New Year's context, resolutions as concepts are everywhere in stories. Uh, in fact, you'd be hard-pressed to name any story at all where the lead character doesn't make some sort of resolution to take action. So that's what we want to talk about today. Resolutions. How they're used in some of our favorite stories, uh, how we try to use them in our own stories, and why they're so important, both in the stories we tell and the stories of our own lives. All right, so now let's, let's go to both of our, our co-hosts here. Let's start with the one who's uh, furiously taking notes right now, uh, Mandy Hauk. <laughs> Mandy, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. Oh, good. Oh, good. Do you, you want to uh, share any resolutions with us? Well, actually, this year I decided to do monthly resolutions. That was my resolution, was to do oh. monthly resolutions, to give myself a little grace. So um, for this month, now you want to talk grace. My resolution is to make my bed every day before my second cup of coffee and to take all my vitamins before the end of the day. So I'm trying to baby myself a little so that I can feel really good about myself. I, I actually really like that. Thank you. Um, I, I was, you know, going to sound cliche for a lawyer. I was reading a book about like, you know, habits and productivity. And one of the things they were saying is that it's good to tie a habit to a specific thing. So mm -hmm. tying, making your bed to, you know, your second cup of coffee of the day, that, that's actually very effective. It, yeah, I have made my bed every day this year. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time, I didn't have to, like, decide to do that. I just did it. But, you know, I don't know. All right. And our other co-host for this episode, Christina Brown. Christina, how are you doing? I'm great and fully in support of Mandy's resolutions. This is fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Right. So, so tell us about your resolutions. You know, I have had some mm, thoughts about making resolutions and dabbled here and there with some thoughts of resolutions of various kinds. And I haven't decided on anything yet, which might mean that there are none. However... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm thinking through it. I think actually that's not true. I kind of have a family resolution, which is to, let's see, to kind of like institute some kind of quietude in our household this mm. year on a, if not daily basis, semi daily basis, just really encourage like my husband and my kids and myself to really just say, let us sit and not say anything, not listen to anything and be quiet and see oh, what happens. So oh, That sounds really scary. It is scary, but I think it's worth doing. I think I it's agree. worth doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially training small children. Like, I would love to be able to to really help them be like, I don't have to be afraid of quiet, you know? Yes, like, absolutely. That'll be hard, especially for my daughter, I think. She's such an extrovert. And like one time she even said like, Mama, I don't like being quiet. And I was like, well, why not, honey? She's like, well, because my mouth doesn't like being quiet. Oh, <laughs> like, that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> Exactly. So, I love that. But it's just so, oh my goodness. Yeah. We, we're, our society is so loud um, that 
even where I was talking to my sister-in-law and um, her power went out a couple days ago and she's like, yeah, I just forget how quiet it is. Like yeah. even that, that hum of electronics in the background you don't really think about, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not there and all of a sudden you're like, wow. That's what, that's what I think whenever I watch a movie that takes place like in the olden times. So like I was watching A Christmas Carol <laughs> and Scrooge is just like eating dinner and he's just like, what? Like, sitting there yeah like, oh gosh that sounds awful but um so anyway resolutions yes they're obviously on on the brain right now but the more you get to think about resolutions they they are very very common in stories to the point where when i was sort of going through this show topic trying to think of okay what are some good examples of resolutions and stories i realized what i was doing is like what are examples of stories in literature? It's, it's, it's almost hard to separate the two. Uh, let me start off with the, the very obvious examples. Um, I, I was watching this uh, interesting YouTube video the other day that was analyzing music in Disney songs, especially like the Disney Renaissance. So like Little Mermaid to Tarzan. So late 80s to 90s. And they mentioned that there's a very specific type of song in a usually a specific type of order that each of them have. There's the establishing the world song, mm -hmm. where it's part just, of your world. <laughs> well, or wait, no, sorry, that's that's the wrong one. Yeah, so there's the establish the world song. So, so um, like in uh, Beauty and the Beast, to be in this poor provincial town, right, blah, right. blah blah blah. Mm, right. Then there's the I want song, mm -hmm. where the hero talks about the thing that they want. I want to be where the people are. There right. You know. <laughs> and then, I want to see. Yep. Yeah. I want adventure in the great wide. So, so <laughs> Ooh, it's like they, they talk, great... they use the phrase I want. Yes. Mm. And that sounds a whole heck of a lot like a resolution to me. I resolve to do X. Yeah. Then the other ones they have there, there's the villain song and the, the love song, yes. which because I'm a grumpy old man always makes me roll my eyes. But, <laughs> but, but the, the fact is, these Disney Renaissance movies, which had this formula down as slickly as anyone, thought this was so important that one of their major songs was assigned specifically to it. Right. And those are the clear examples. But if you look at pretty much any movie, any book, any TV series, you're going to be able to pin down probably a scene where the protagonist resolves to take some sort of action. Mm-hmm. This can happen in the, at the end of the first act. It could happen at the beginning of the third act. There's variations there, but the fact that the protagonist resolves to take some sort of action is considered pivotal to the plot of stories, right? Yeah. Like Mandy? I think so, and I, was, I think the antagonist also. Yeah. Because you have to have the opposing force, mm. and I think you've just hit on what the opposing force is. Um, the protag's resolution, or what they want, in some way is blocked or blocks the, um, is either blocked by what the, what the antagonist wants or um, the reason the antagonist doesn't like them is because what they want is gonna I mean, mess very, that up. Very clear example would be The Lion King. It would be a lot clearer than Simba, the sentence I where just like said. Where like Simba's I want song is, oh, I just can't wait yeah. to be king. So he right. wants to be king. Yes. Then Scar's villain song is, oh, be yeah. prepared for when Scar will Gar be king. Scar wants to be king. There, there you go. Let the AKA reader understand, Hamlet. both of these cannot <laughs> hold. Only one of them can be king. I just realized that is where Lion King differs from Hamlet, other than the whole animal thing. Because um, it is a retelling of Hamlet, if anyone hasn't thought of that before. Sit with a second. It's pretty cool. That is cool. But the only thing is Hamlet, in Hamlet, he doesn't want to be king. He just wants revenge. Well, actually, I want to talk about Hamlet in a bit. Oh, good. Uh, but but first, uh, Christina, your thoughts uh, maybe on Disney, the I Want song. Do, do, does the, is this tracking with you so far? It is. I mean, especially in that era. I, I can't say that I've watched a ton of super recent Disney films. Um, I don't know if I could sort of lump Pixar into there. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. But I if mean, you're talking about oh, yeah. 80s, 90s, then yeah, I could absolutely see that. Well, you can look at more true. modern stuff. There's the I Want song in Tangled, where that song about seeing the lights and whatever. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then mm -hmm. Frozen, I think Let It Go could very clearly be the Let the It I Go Want is song. Elsa's, but then Anna has one too, like Open Up the Gates. Or oh, I was going to yeah. say Anna is more yeah. of the I Want, I think. 
I think. Yeah. Elsa, yeah. Elsa's is the resolution. So you the, know, the, Elsa the tropes was to, are still going. She, Elsa was yeah. supposed to be the antagonist, but then they liked that song and decided to turn her into a protagonist, the Let It Go song. Interesting. Yeah, she was going to okay. be evil. Well, in the real story, she is. Right. Okay. Well, what do you mean? Ask Hans. Queen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but Maybe I mean, Hans was getting a bad rap. Yeah. But anyway. I mean, even now, see, it's funny because now I'm just thinking about um, fairy tales. I'm stuck on fairy tales. It's a good place to be like, stuck. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you know, this is a good place to begin with the whole concept of resolutions and stories because this is where it will be laid out the clearest. Yeah. Happy because ending. Because in, in musicals, the characters have the luxury of being able to just tell the audience what they want. Mm -hmm. If it's not a musical, it'd be kind of clunky if, you know, it's just like, I want to be part of that world, right? You know what? That's a really good point. That is a really, I have never thought of that distinction with musicals that they can just directly communicate with the audience. In, in, in related to that, wow. in the yeah. Well, well, thank you, Mandy. Yeah. Uh, in related to that, with uh, with Disney movies or you know things in that genre, is it's for kids. So I think we're all cool with you know laying it out a little bit more for for the younger audience. Mm -hmm. But other movies, maybe it's not quite as obvious. Uh, let's sort of swing to the other side of the pendulum uh, okay. because Mandy, I dabble <laughs> in reading great literature, but I, really? I, I have not attempted to write it in quite some time. Uh, you do it. You do write literary oh, fiction. Okay. So, so do you feel like this whole process of having uh, a resolution is uh, an integral part of literary fiction too? Yes. But I, I do want to say, I always get uncomfortable when I say I write literary fiction and I finally realize it's because it it sounds like I'm saying I write great literature, and that is exactly what I don't mean. So I got to like <laughs> knock you down there. Anyway, um, but literary fiction, what I would say is the difference is that the re resolution is internal um, more, more often mm -hmm. rather than. Mm. Um, so I guess Little Mermaid is a literary cartoon. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that's what I would say. So like my protagonists, they want um, freedom from the abusive parent or they want um, in, in another book that in, in one of my other stories, um, he actually wants to find his lost parent. So I guess that's sort of internal and yeah. external. Yeah. But the, um, I think the greatest tension is what's happening inside does, it, does that make sense? So it's like, yeah. why does he want to find his father who left? Because there's unresolved, he doesn't know if his father left him. Did his father leave because of him? Like, that's the impetus for him leaving is he thinks it's his fault and he wants to resolve the relationship. Yeah, you know? so, so, so there's two levels here I want right. to talk about. One, there's the internal factors versus the external factors, right? right? So... Uh, let, let's let's explain this a little bit more, Mandy. Put on your uh, your English teacher hat. Okay. So, <laughs> what what would you say the difference between in? Hello, Lewis. My best friend, Lewis the cat, is here to join us at the table. <laughs> <laughs> How would you say that would differ, especially in like a literary context, between these these sort of internal desires and these external ones? Um. Well, I I don't think they can totally be separate unless you're really talking about just like a thriller and mm -hmm. you know it's a pure genre it's just going to be um catch the killer you know mm -hmm. and but but a pd james for example who is more of a literary mystery <laughs> author yes lewis um she went into like this the psyche or the um emotion of her detective so it wasn't to for him, what was his name again? Dashel something? Da yeah, Dashel something. Anyway, um, <laughs> we're so good at this. Oh, we're pros, people. Um, so when it, so um, for a mystery that's more on the literary side, what makes it more literary is that there is a personal stake, like an internal um, drive on the part of the detective or the amateur detective or whoever. So for example, Agatha Christie, brilliant, I love her. That was not really literary fiction because you didn't ever really know 
oh, what is Miss Marple going through? Like, how is this going to affect her if she does not find out who's the killer? But for P.D. James' detective, like, he was, like, angst-filled and, like, hmm. you know, doubt-ridden. And does that make sense? Yeah, so, so it's the difference, like, an external thing would be, like, in the Maltese Falcon. You want to find the Maltese Falcon. Find the Falcon, yeah. Whereas the internal will be, I want to uh, have a feeling that I'm making a, a difference in the world. I want to be loved or yes. something like that. Yeah. Yes, there you go. Okay, okay. I stumbled through that. <laughs> You really know how to sell your own work, don't you, Mandy? Oh, yes. <laughs> what were we talking about platforms the other day? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I do think a lot of times these are interconnected, too, because um, the, exter the external thing can oftentimes, if you're a skilled writer, be sort of a, a mirrored reflection of, of something going on inside. Mm -hmm. So uh, w one book that I think is a really good example of this is Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by uh, mm. Gail Honeyman. It's on my to-read list, it's and so I haven't good. read it yet, so and I good. hear it's good. Yeah, so it's it's about this girl who seems very straight-laced and boring and fine, but you find out throughout the book she's actually dealing with a lot of trauma and repressing it. <gasps> it Spoiler! It, but it's, she's but it's, not completely fine! But it's kind of played for, like, some... for laughs. It's really funny. It's ironic. It's really good. But the the... Every story, in addition to having this resolution, has this impetus. Like, something needs to happen to get the action going. Even right. in this book, which I think would tend more toward the literary, the impetus of action that kicks things off is Eleanor decides she's fallen in love with a local musician on Instagram. Oh. So because of that, that gets her to do these external things. Mm. And in taking those external things, she starts doing these internal resolutions, too. So they're, right. they're mm. connected there. Absolutely. Okay, Christina, what, what, what is your take on the, the literary thing? I, I think if you're going to try to poke a hole in my theory that every story needs a resolution, you, you'd probably be able to find it somewhere in the literary realm. Is that your <laughs> thought? Am I just sticking too much to Disney? <laughs> you always stick to Disney, Matt. But that's okay. It's a classic. It's good. It's familiar. It's good. It's good. But I want to like, hear you bring in more mystery. You're really good at that. you got to bring in some more detective stuff. Well, it's good stuff. Well, actually, sure. Uh, so for the, <laughs> the detective thing, this is another thing where the external and the internal can echo when done correctly. Mm -hmm. um, like you said, Mandy, it, the, you can write a perfectly satisfactory mystery where... The only conflict is the detective's external conflict, like, I want to solve the mystery. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes what you will see, to greater or lesser effect, is there's also this internal um, desire that's um, echoed or mirrored in it. So maybe this case brings up some, like, ghost from the detective's past. Right. Or there's some personal tie-in that they have. Or for whatever reason, they feel that they need, the, need to solve this for themselves as a human being. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, they're, so there, there are the two levels of the resolution, but the resolution is going to be the same. The detective, at some point very on, early on in the story, will resolve, yes, I must solve this case. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Hmm. So now let's go to some examples that might be a little different. Uh, I was thinking of some examples where finding the resolution is kind of the plot where the character, the protagonist wants to resolve to do something. And that's sort of the, the whole point of it. Are, are you too familiar with the movie, The Graduate? Oh, 100%. Do you like I The Graduate it, or do you over. hate it? I love it. I do too. Okay, Yay. good. Oh, that was going to be bad. Woo. Oh, we, we got so excited. Lewis ran away. <laughs> Come back, Lewis. Um, Lewis, I, uh, I don't know it. Christina, we're, we're are you familiar? Okay. No, no it's Lewis and I are on the same page Danielle here. Danielle has not seen it. it. I don't want to show it to her because I know she'd hate it. <laughs> I have been after my children to watch this movie for literally years. I mean, let's just say since they've been like, I don't know, 19 or 20. Maybe a little older. It's not yeah. really... <laughs> This is not for Edmund and Edith. <laughs> if you ever see it, you're going to go, wow, himself. is it not? Anyway, um, no, it's one of my favorite movies. So let me give a quick plot synopsis without spoiling much. Uh, because I think this is a good example of the character's inability to find resolution being the problem that is eventually mm. solved. So one of the reasons I love this movie so much is that I first saw it right as I was graduating from college into the heart of the recession. 
Oh, I, so, it was when I was graduating from college, but there oh, was there no recession. Go. Oh, there you go. The recession, so. Black Monday happened at the beginning of my college. <laughs> and then <laughs> 1987. Uh, your recession was slightly old. better time than mine. Yeah. <laughs> ah. But uh, anyway, the protagonist, uh, played by Dustin Hoffman. First he's... movie. Yeah. Well, first lead. This made him a star. Yes. He uh, graduates from this fancy college out east, comes back home. His parents throw him a big party because he's like a big dude back east. He's on the track team. He runs the newspaper. But now he comes back and he's very anxious about what he should do with his future. And, you know, the dad's friend's like, hey, I have a secret for you. Plastics. It's the material right. of the future. <laughs> so he literally spends the next several weeks drifting in his uh, backyard pool. Yes, that's he like the He cannot take scene. action. He he's has no raft. resolution, so he's just drifting. And during this time, one of his, the wife of one of his dad's business associates, Mrs. Robinson, makes some not-so-subtle passes at him. And Bancroft. Yes. Go ahead. Who is fantastic in the role. Amazing. And Dustin Hoffman and Mrs. Robinson start having an affair. So he's sort of doing this, but doesn't quite know why. But then later on, Christina, I don't, if you don't want to see it after my description. <laughs> uh, later on, Dustin Hoffman falls in love with Mrs. Robinson's daughter. I thought you weren't going to have spoilers. And this is the impetus <laughs> to finally get him to make a resolution. Yes. I won't tell you what the resolution is, but the yes. fact that he finally makes a resolution is the turning point of the film. Yes. Should I choose he the goes, mother or the daughter? I feel like that's a conversation it's very hard to come oh back gosh. from. Should you what? I'm sorry. I choose the mother or the daughter. Hey, Elaine. I really like no, you, we but like we, we need to talk. Me and your mom. Uh, yeah. Ah. But <laughs> FYI, if you're like, Mrs. Robinson, hey, Simon and Garfunkel did a song called Mrs. Robinson. Dang right they did. Yeah. It was for this movie. So... But yeah, that, that is an example. It's sort of a counterexample where he doesn't have a resolution. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's sort of the exception that proves the rule where the very fact that he can't resolve to do anything is the problem. That is the tension. Yeah. But it's that still goes back to your point where you said every uh -huh. story has to have a resolution. So you're still proving mm -hmm. your point. You know, it's, yep. yeah. I don't know. I feel, I'm trying to think because I was trying to think of exceptions to the rule. And I don't know that there necessarily is one, although... Um, Mandy, you and I were talking sort of about the the um, the non-reliable narrator. And right. I was thinking, you know, especially like in stories. I don't know that I know movies in particular that have done it particularly well, but yeah, I know in some tricky. stories, like novels and books and like short stories and things, or even poems, if you find a good one, you know, like the narrator who doesn't know much and you don't know quite anything, but there's still a piece of a story in there that you have to grab onto. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I feel like it's. There, I just don't know that I have concrete examples. Yeah. In, in there, I think that's a really good point to bring up. I, I think the answer is a lot of times, probably not every time, but I think a lot of times there's an unreliable narrator. That unreliable narrator isn't necessarily the protagonist. So like they're, they're viewing the protagonist. Um, so, you know, a good example might be Nick Carraway in The Great Gatsby. Oh, you can, absolutely. You can debate whether he's reliable or unreliable. He may be unreliable, but he's not the protagonist. Right, like he, Scout is the narrator in To yeah. Kill a Mockingbird, but she's not the main character. Exactly. So right. Scout will will be able to see Atticus, the main protagonist, mm -hmm. and we, we see his resolution. Exactly. And same deal with Nick Carraway and Greg Gadsby. We see Gadsby's resolution. We have his I want speech pretty doggone clear, mm -hmm. uh, even if the narrators aren't. Um, th there might be counterexamples there, too, where there, there might be an unreliable narrator who's also the protagonist. Well, were you, you were talking about Piranesi, which I haven't read yet. Is Piranesi... Uh, oh, that's a good example. I okay, let's work Piranesi. through this. Oh, Piranesi. Oh, Piranesi. Sorry. Well, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> that one... Okay. Ooh, he's thinking. Wheels are... His first wheels. of all, readers, I know I say this all the time, but if you readers. haven't read Piranesi <laughs> yet, readers, listeners... Fast forward. Go read this. Go read the book. <laughs> it's it's one of one of my favorite books ever. It's I, one of my favorites too. It's pretty incredible. Um, but I think the, the so the protagonist, his want, his resolution is to take care of the house, right? To uh, discover and don't, it. Don't spoil to, it for Mandy. Really want her to read this. More information comes out throughout the course of the book, <laughs> saying that indicating maybe. Cl cl plug your ears, maybe. Well, do, Indicating do that may not listeners? have always been his <laughs> resolution, but his resolution at the beginning is that. Okay. And part of the delight of the book is realizing how that may have changed over time. 
Yeah, it's interesting to me because because there is a resolution that develops for him. And it is a personal, I guess we want to define resolution too. Like, does the resolution as we are talking about in this podcast episode involve a character's choice? Or is it the story needs some kind of resolution? So we're talking about a choice here, right? An act of oh, choice. Yes, that, that, no, that's, talk- I, I'm, I'm glad you, you asked that question. So okay. yeah, it, uh, to, to, to clarify, yes, you, you were right. Uh, the resolution is the character making, I resolve okay. to take X action because awesome. I want Y. Got it, okay. Right. Just because I want this thing, I resolve to take this action to get that thing. So character, right. resolution. Res- yeah, so we're not resolve. talking about resolution. like denouement, like yeah. resolution right. at the end of the book. Okay. It's like, it's what they hope for, what they choose to pursue. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. I mean, I just want to kind of clarify too, because the root word of resolve is, is sort of like a dissolution. It's like almost like a dissolve, Dis- dissolve, dissolve, which is oh, that's weird. really weird. I know. It's so kind it's of like the opposite loosen, of what we mean by it now. I know. So I'm trying to figure out like, how did this happen? But anyway, so just like clarification of I terms. I love etymology. Oh, I know, man. I could just go so deep. Oh, yeah. So deep, so fast, so bad. <laughs> no, but yeah, so Piranesi, it is, I was kind of wondering because the, the resolution is very hard and coming for this character. Okay. Because and Mandy, you need to read it so we can I all know. talk about it openly. <laughs> can I finish writing my book first? I guess. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'm going to put this on the podcast right now. I have determined, I have resolved. <laughs> <laughs> good job. Look how I did that. That was good. Was really good. To, so, because I am in the process, um, I showed Christina earlier, I have printed out, I finally finished the actual narrative, and I printed it out, and I'm going through and doing like paper um, edits, and then um, I have resolved that I'm sending it to my agent on Monday, January 23rd. Whoa. So. Very exciting. Whoa. Yes. Ding it. After okay. your second cup of coffee. Yes. You're going <laughs> to yeah. make your bed, drink to... your second cup of coffee, yes. and then send and off the manuscript. I have to have the first cup of coffee so I have energy <laughs> to make the aforementioned bed. Then I have my second cup of coffee with my vitamins. <laughs> Then I will say, yes. <laughs> so I, one of the things I'm coming to like about this topic is I feel like I, you can take almost any work of fiction and, and do this sort of anal, uh, analyze this. Another yeah. example I think is interesting, kind of along the graduate lines, is Casablanca. Oh, yeah. That is another issue where the main character... The problem is he won't resolve to do anything until the very end. And the right. fact that he will resolve to do something at the end is, is sort of the, the whole story. And then he resolves to be a friend. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's just the last line. <laughs> I was just kidding. But at the beginning, Rick, but, Humphrey Bogart, his, his philosophy is, I don't stick my neck out for anyone mm-hmm. because, you know, he'd been burned in the past, all this mm-hmm. stuff. Love has done him wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So he's a person who won't resolve to take any action. And that's right. sort of his problem. We, we get hints throughout the throughout the movie that maybe he's actually secretly a good guy down there, but he's mm-hmm. he's so hardened off. He's a bad guy. Girls love him. Uh, I love Humphrey Bogart. I, really? Oh, I love him. He looks a lot like my grandfather. I'll have to send you pictures. Interesting. He's not my grandfather. <laughs> this is not a, you know, revelation on the podcast <laughs> or anything. <laughs> but anyway, in the, 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 the end, it's basically the climax of the story is Rick resolving to take action, to mm-hmm. take a stand in a, in a selfless way. Mm-hmm. So the, the whole story is him finding his resolution, his resolve. Yes. And another example of just along these lines is something we mentioned earlier, Hamlet. This is the ultimate example, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. So I just have to say though, does resolution then resolve, does it always involve courage of some kind? Uh, <laughs> you broke Matt. <laughs> you broke Matt. <laughs> he just, did you hear that? His engine just. <laughs> Where's Lewis? Lewis, That's come revive Matthew. Um, I mean, usually, so usually when you see it, they're, the resolve to do something is going to take courage, especially if it's something more of a right. genre narrative, right? Right. Well, but in the graduate, it does. <laughs> In well, the graduate, it does. The graduate, it takes the... courage. Casablanca does. Right, and we love that this the heroic 
you know, character, right? We, we yeah. resonate with heroic choices. There that are some people make, that kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say, was Little Mermaid, was she courageous? Or but was that's she what I'm just, saying, though, is there pompousness, too? Well, like, that's what I, the, no, I'm like, agreeing with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. The cry, like the sort of antithesis. Well, the, but, the decision yeah. to take action is sort of intrinsically courageous of a sort. Right, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the moral or admirable thing. I was just about to say that. Remember, all the, all the villains resolve to do stuff, well, too. That's what I was just saying. That's and yeah. you can make an argument in Little Mermaid. Uh, sorry, I'm probably, <laughs> okay. sorry if I'm stealing your point. But no. Ariel, Ariel resolves to do something that is reckless and stupid. Yes. Right. So what I, all I was going to say is there are two ways to, when we say courage, there are they don't, we're not always saying the same thing. Like, mm -hmm. courage can just be, I'm facing something that's scary. It might not be morally courageous, which is I mean, touching Scar's off what you said. I mean, Scar's decision to kill Mufasa took a lot of courage. Courage, but not a, not, not as a moral, uh, what am I trying to say? But again, to, that could be, yeah, I know what you're saying. There's, I know, but there's a word in there rolling around. Oh, I hate that. Moral attribute. But yeah, I mean, it can be, it can be the, the, the end. Uh, the antithesis. antithesis of right. <laughs> jinxy, mm -hmm. jinx. No, but like, um, there, there's a there's a the, the adverse. I guess there's a, sort of the, mm -hmm. the adverse flipping it on its head. That virtue. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm glad you threw that in there because I just lost it. I was going to say it was perfect timing. Yeah, Mandy. I'm so Love sorry. It. No, no, it's yeah. good. It was like perfect timing. But yeah, courage isn't always necessarily virtuous. Well, there's again like that that pompousness, right? The pride, mm -hmm. right? The the courageousness often comes from humility, right? And you know that you're not worthy of such whatever, or you don't have the skills, but you know you need to to make the attempt and, and be brave mm -hmm. anyway. To go kind of Aristotelian, there's mm -hmm. a lot. There's the view of uh, virtue as sort of the the media, the middle way between two uh, two extreme vices. So right. well, that's for courage, for, one yeah. one extreme is cowardice, the other mm -hmm. extreme is recklessness. Sure, and right. somewhere in the middle there is the virtuous right. way. So I would think maybe if, maybe we would say courage if what they're choosing is morally right, but maybe temerity would be the better. If I'm remembering what temerity means, I was going to say to define that word. I'm not sure that I doesn't heard that it. mean. Excuse me, I'm googling right now. You I like that word, whatever it is. I think I th I remember I taught it in vocabulary. I think temerity, what like boldness, uh, something right, like that. Right, but yeah. but not, not timorous, because that's like the opposite, right? <laughs> Language is, is funny that way. Ex I know. Terrific and terrible have the exact same root word, but they mean opposite things now. That's true. That's okay, funny. temerity. I was right. Uh -huh. Good job. Just, you know, note it, <laughs> mark it down. Excessive confidence, like I oh. am right now. Okay. Or boldness, audacity. So temerity is more you're being audacious. Okay. So okay. that would go back to scar. Audacity. Interesting. So it, yeah. it takes um, a, a sort of internal strength, but it's more temerity than than what we normally think of when we say, oh, good job, that was so courageous of you. Yeah, and you can think of characters, you know, that this is a common sort of trope of a character in literature who like makes the decision like, I'm just gonna look out for myself, I'm gonna survive everyone else, whatever. That is a cowardly resolution, right, yes. objectively, but it is still making a resolution to take action, which, right. I guess is better than apathy and despair and nihilism. But Maybe? I don't, I don't know. know. But I think the, oh. the very fact, and also this comes to the fact that it's a story. I think to get a story going, you need some sort of action to kick it off. And that action is almost always going to involve some sort of resolve to take action. Right. Which usually involves something resembling courage, even if it's... Um, Temerity. Yeah, even if it's <laughs> done in an unwise way or even if it's uh, directed at the wrong aim. Mm -hmm. Here's where I was going though with that. And because uh, as we were talking, I was decided to Google the use of, of courage, kind of a defining, like the definition. And the root word does come from old French. <laughs> and uh, courage. Yes, courage. <laughs> yes, that's not a thing. But it, it's, it's heart. It's courage. Oh, okay. oh cour cour yeah. courage. Cour yeah, yes, exactly. Cour yeah. Courage. I don't, yeah. Yeah. But but that's cool though because that does go to our point, right? It's an act. It's an action of the heart, oh, whether a that's good. good or a bad or a moral or virtuous. You know, this is my best moment of the whole day. This is fantastic. <laughs> I love knowing that <laughs> etymology. Etymology. I know all the time, everywhere. Yes, it wins. It does. Yeah, Lewis right. agrees. 
So that that was that was that was a good that was a good uh, sort of clarification you made there, and I, I think that's helpful to to frame this. And and I think there's another thing I want to discuss related to it, mm -hmm. and that is the aspect of how the resolution of the character can change throughout the course of the story. Um, I, I think there's usually in most stories, you know, if we're looking at like the hero's journey or what, what we're usually looking at with the three act structure, there will be two big decision points. There's the decision point at the end of act one, when the character decides, okay, I'm going to take this action to get this thing. So if, let's use an example. We all know uh, it's Luke Skywalker <laughs> talking to Obi-Wan after Luke's uh, aunt and uncle been killed by the stormtroopers. I, I want to go with you. Learn the ways of for the Force. Become a Jedi like my father. That's him res making resolution to take action, mm -hmm. and it kicks off the main part of the story. So that's the resolu the the resolve at the end of Act One. Then there's the resolve at the beginning of Act Three, where basically mm -hmm. the character gets to the point. Okay, I've made my decision. How far do I want to take this? Do I want to take it to the end to end it for once and for all? Mm -hmm. Again, let's go back to Star Wars. This would be when Luke at the end of Return of the Jedi, goes to confront the Emperor, right? Where he's like, okay, I had this resolve to be a Jedi, to do this, to do that. Am I going to take it all the way to confront the main villain and do this? Will I pay the actual price that it costs to achieve what I think I wanted? Yes, yes. exactly. And let's go. Uh, Evangeline, unfortunately, could not join us for the round table, but yeah. she was uh, uh, giving some ideas before we recorded and she mentioned uh, Lord of the Rings. I think that's actually a really good example too, where <coughs> you see the resolve of Frodo shifting throughout the, the series, where at the beginning, his resolve is just to not get killed and get the ring to Rivendell. Mm -hmm. Then his big moment of resolution at the sort of at the end of act one of the trilogy is him saying, I'll take the ring to Mordor, I'll do it. That's him resolving, I will do X thing. Mm -hmm. Then when you get to the end of Return of the King and he's at Mount Doom, that resolve, like you mentioned earlier, Mandy, it's like, okay, I, I resolve to do this. Do I really want to do whatever it takes to do it? And it keeps uh, growing and developing all along the way. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think one of the main tensions is that his resolve wanes, mm -hmm. don't you think? In that story in particular, that's the source of a lot of the tension is when Frodo starts to quail and... Mm -hmm. Um, question, is he really willing to do everything that's necessary? Yep. Something, uh, another good example of that is uh, seeing how, like, Resolve can warp would be Macbeth. Oh! Where initially, <laughs> after he, you know, gets to prophecy from the witches, he decides, you know what? I do want to be king. Yeah. So you know what? I'll kill the king and I'll be... So that is a Resolve to take action. <laughs> yes. Then as the play keeps going, you can see this resolve sort of warping and twisting and going into darker areas. So yes, it, that's the resolve it. changes as the as the play goes. Excellent. Well, and back to Hamlet, Claudius, his resolve yeah. caused the whole problem. His, it, res, you know, to kill, or Scar, Claudius Scar, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> take your pick. Um, to kill his own brother, to get his, the wife and the, you know, throne. And, and again, Hamlet's the perfect example of the main conflict is, will he resolve to take action at all? So you're That's like, okay, true. is this ghost telling me the truth? Is it lying? Do I really want to kill my uncle? Right. Do I... Well, and you know what? Hamlet's also a good example of an unreliable narrator. Yeah. Because, you know, I've seen it and I've, I've actually, I've been Queen Gertrude. To, nice. Um, nice. Yeah. So okay. my friend Dana, who was on the horror movie podcast mm -hmm. that we did, he was, I met him because he was my son, Hamlet. Um, <laughs> and um, th that was a big question as we were in rehearsals is, does he play him crazy? Does he play him pretending to be crazy, mm. which was his choice. And it was mm. awesome because then whenever he was facing the audience, Dane is a brilliant actor, but whenever he was facing the audience, his face would change. And that really changes the story because if he's yeah, crazy, yeah, then his resolution is kind of... He, he hasn't resolved really? to do anything. He's no. just bouncing all over the but place. But if he's pretending to be crazy, then it's... Um, Cut sort of a strategic he, thing. He made his resolve earlier on, and he's just hiding it from the rest of exactly. the characters. Exactly, but the way Shakespeare's written it, it really is kind of up to 
whomever is playing the role to decide. Oh, that's Shakespeare. I know. <laughs> oh, Bill, that, you did it again. <laughs> those are my favorite playwrights. Tennessee Williams does the same thing. Mm-hmm. You can play his roles differently. Mm-hmm. And, and it comes down to, okay, this is what that person is doing, but the why yeah. might shift. And that's those are the, my favorite kinds of plays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So now let's go. Let's make this, let's get this a little bit more personal now. So we talked about examples of characters making resolutions in, in other movies or books or whatever. Now let's talk about what we've done as artists and the stuff that we create. So uh, Christina or Mandy, uh, th- I'd like you to think about times when you've had to give your character like this moment of resolution, that this resolve to do something. And uh, I, I'll, I'll start with mine. Um, I remember as I was sort of putting together my book, this sort of way back when I'm still just sort of cobbling together, you know, different scenes into a plot. I had one of the first clear scenes that came to my head was the character at his low point, then resolving to take action to sort of come back out, out of the low point. Oh, I like and that. And I, I planned that dialogue so carefully. It was there. So that would be sort of the, the uh, action that's done at the beginning of Act 3. Three. Mm-hmm. So that one it just sort of came to me. And I haven't substantially changed it since. But what I did find really challenging is giving him the motivation at the beginning of Act 1. Because... Uh, for the few listeners who don't know, first of all, congratulations on making it this far. But <laughs> writing a middle grade adventure novel, really excited about it. Thank you for asking. But um, <laughs> it was very hard for me to give the character something that he wanted that didn't sound totally cliche and that every other character didn't have to, right? Right. Because, you know, my character's already an orphan. He already wants to get into, like, this fancy school. So it's like, yeah, yeah, I know it sounds like Harry Potter, but shut up. This is my thing. Um, <laughs> so so giving, giving him that, making it clear to, like, a middle grade audience without telegraphing it too much, I found very, very challenging. So just for me, through happenstance, resolve at the beginning of Act 3, I think, was sort of one of my initial impetuses. But... The resolve at the end of Act One was really brutal. Yeah. How about you, Mandy? You have it even tougher in the literary world. Well, and also the thing for me, I think I've said this before to you. I don't know if it was on the podcast or not, but um, uh, for the most part, I'm pretty sure all the characters that are my protagonists, at least, have I've been inspired by a song or two um that's cool so i t- i really like um as you know i love bluegrass evangeline's not here to <laughs> scoff at me um i love bluegrass and folk music and typically their songs are stories mm-hmm. um, but they're just a snatch of a story so basically it ends up um sort of wetting my appetite and wondering what's the rest of this story mm-hmm. that I only heard three and a half minutes of, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. you know, and so, um, and if I have a character that's hard to write, I go looking for a song that oh, I can that's really like, cool. yeah. So I actually have songs for that. all my main characters. Um, that's really cool. But so typically in a song, there's like, usually there's, some kind of longing at Mm -hmm. least. Um, So that's sort of the beginning of when they would make a resolution. So I sort of have the beginning of it, but I do have to sit with them. I can't really start writing until I have really thought through who my character is and who they have been and who they want to be. So usually in there, the who they want to be ends up, there's an action that has to take place. They're either leaving where they've been or you know, leaving their past or going toward their future or both. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's a little more abstract, but I will say that my first draft of this, not my first, first draft, I don't know how many drafts, <laughs> the first draft, <laughs> the first draft that my agent saw that silly me, I thought I was done. Um, she <laughs> is very kind. Um, and she was like, you know, I just, I'm having a really hard time understanding what's different about Poppy. That's my main character. And like, why, like, 
basically, what does she want? Like, mm, right. <laughs> so I was Can like, you write her an I want song. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, she does sing, actually. But anyway, um, so I realized that basically I had developed the character, but I had put her in this story where everything was just happening to her. Hmm. Um, and so it was really when I sat with her and I was like, yeah, what does Poppy want? Like, what makes her different from a, you know, she just was sort of two dimensional. So as I thought through that, mm -hmm. um, it gave me all these other plot points that I need, you know, yeah. more interesting things happened to her for one thing, because she had to get out of them or solve them or, um, yeah. So I would say actually, now that I think about it, I think Poppy is sort of like one of the characters you're talking about who in the beginning, they don't, they haven't resolved anything, but then they're forced to. Yeah. Something happens to her that forces her to take action when really she didn't, she just wanted to live her quiet life. Yep. That's, that's what gets the story started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then yeah. something happens. <laughs> yeah. That's like the second line of all Typically. the story writing guides, right? <laughs> yeah. Something <laughs> happens. <laughs> yep. I thought of it. Uh, well, what I was thinking, is this an exception? But then I realized it's kind of not an exception. It's like an inverse. But where a storyteller is telling a story from a past perspective, almost like a heartbreak, this is what I wish. But mm -hmm. it still involves resolve or resolution because I wish I had resolved to do X. And mm -hmm. this is how my story turned out because I did not resolve Oh, it. so even regret is a type of sort yeah. of a reverse a reverse resolution. sort of resolution in a Which way. makes sense because... Or can be. Or it can be. Yeah. Because one of the things Evangeline wanted to talk about was, um, or talk to us about with um, Lord of the Rings was the um, hope is embedded in the, um, in the act of making a, a mm -hmm. choice or a resolution, you're hoping. Because like, even if you go back to New Year's resolutions or monthly resolutions, I really hope I make my bed every day. <laughs> You know, I would, that's kind of, that's sort of part and parcel of what a resolution is, is something you hope to do. Yeah. And it also like underlying that it's well, like, I hope to, to yeah. Right. Yeah. I hope to be more organized or I hope to develop this good habit or that right. good habit, which in turn will, you know, make me a better person in some right. way. Right. So yeah. I, I hope to do that because I feel like it will benefit me mm -hmm. in some way or someone benefit someone. Yeah. Um, at least if we're talking about the virtuous re result. Well, right. re <laughs> well and, and even then. Otherwise, it's like, I aim to do it, and it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, even then, I, I think getting back to what we were talking about with, like, the, the courage thing, like, the opposite of making a resolution isn't cowardice necessarily, because you can resolve to do the cowardly thing. The opposite is apathy and despair, right? Because if you're not even going to resolve to save your own skin, like that's something even beneath that where it's like, right. Right. Uh, what's the point? Like right. that, that's the antithesis. That's nihilism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Or if you make that decision not to pursue the girl, I was kind right. of thinking about that with them. Um, you're talking about folk songs and, and how a lot of those songs are often songs of regret, you know? Oh yes. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's like, I, I am bemoaning or bewailing or whatever my, my lack of resolution, if only I had, and this is where I lost, you know? Mm -hmm. But again, like the whole purpose of that song is, is like resolution. Like if I had made this courageous choice. Right. Will I know? do it differently in the future? Exactly. Which is, yeah. Or will my children, or here's the story why, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So I guess that kind of asks us like, why is resolution so important in life, in humans, <laughs> right. in mm -hmm. humanity? Why do we all need resolution so badly? Yeah, I mean, I, I think most fundamentally is that the decision to take action is sort of the, the opposite of apathy and despair, right? It shows, yes, I an acknowledgement, yes, I need to take action. Action needs to be taken, which means that my action can actually make some sort of difference. Mm -hmm. Either maybe it's just in my life or in others' lives, but the resolve to take action is sort of a the first step away from despair. And can Ooh. we say it's almost a creative choice? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So there you absolutely. go. We were made as creators and we have to, we feel creative when we are taking an active move towards something. Yep. Well, and I think we're just, as ch children of God, we, when we see something wrong, we're moved, moved to, to make take it. action. <laughs> we're moved to make it mm -hmm. right. We're yeah. moved to set things um, the way... 
they should be. And that's why, what is it, the fourfold gospel that they talk about where, um, oh, I'm going to go down a road I'm not going to remember. <laughs> but <laughs> um, we forget to talk about, like, pe people, when they talk about the fall, they typically start, or when they talk about the gospel, they start with the fall, and they forget to go, no, at the beginning it was perfect. Mm -hmm. So there's the, there was perfection, then there was the fall from that. Yeah. And so everything after that is a move back toward what right. was always meant to be. And that's resolution. That's why I love the band Arcadian Wild and their Principium. Uh, Just yes. a plug. Plug. Go listen to Arcadian Wild's album Principium. Okay, we should interview them. There you go. There we go. Let's yeah. put them on the list, Mandy. Let's put them on the list. <laughs> We're making a list, checking it <laughs> Twice. four or five times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. That was the joke references. I was going for. I was just <laughs> <laughs> taking it an artist step further. <laughs> yes. An well, obsessive artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we are about out of time here. Uh, but it, unless there are any final thoughts that in, any of you had on the topic of resolutions. And I, I, I like where we went with this because it goes from sort of this annual sort of half jokey thing we all do because you know the, what's the joke about new year's resolutions that nobody ever keeps them mm -hmm. right. right right but we still keep making them which is an act of hope I, it exactly is. It is. well i will resolve on january 24th to start reading piranesi piranesi yeah Sweet. there we go piranesi <laughs> we should have let's plan on doing a ep whole episode on the of the podcast about piranesi it'll okay. be like a book club so folks okay. listeners do you say piranesi too isn't it there's a no piranesi idea. I thought it was Piranesi. I will ask the author and then maybe we'll I can... put her on the list too. Do you know her? Put Do her you know the author? No. Oh, <laughs> I was like, cool. Oh, awesome. you mean Sue? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll talk <laughs> no, to I Sue totally about it. I totally fooled you. That was great. Oh, so no. good. Yeah. Such a straight poker face. All right. Yeah. But, but anyway. I'm an actress. <laughs> I love it. It's <laughs> so good. I, I hope, I hope listeners, you get that... Whether we're talking about your own personal story of like, I resolved to lose weight or like read more books... Or the, the resolve of people in the great stories. Uh, the resolve, the, the one act of way from despair toward action. It's a, a whole lot rides on it, especially when we're talking about the realm of stories in the Christian imagination. And hope, yeah. And hope. Mm -hmm. And as y'all can probably tell, things are winding down at the Anselm Society Digital Pub. The fire is down to embers, the customers are trundling home, and you've polished off your final glass. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. If you have like 30 or so seconds to spare right now, uh, why not rate and review the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time.